Well, hey, Embrace, it is so good to see you. My name is Adam. I'm one of the pastors here. We are thrilled that you've decided to come and worship with us here today. Uh, I seriously can't believe that it is Labor Day weekend already. Uh, If you're anything like me, I'm doing everything possible to soak up as much of the sun as I can. Uh, Like truly, friends, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, uh, but it could snow next week, okay? Not next week. Next month is actually possible. And so to enjoy the last days of summer, I've even started taking my naps outside. And let's just say my kids think I'm the coolest dad that has ever existed in the history of dadhood. That would be a lie, okay? Uh, So summer is coming to a close. And on that note, I want to let you know, next Sunday is fall kickoff Sunday. And next week, we're going to be starting up a brand new series called Canary in a Coal Mine, a series that I have been looking forward to for months. In this series, we're going to be talking about some of the warning signs in our lives that let us know that something is off inside of us, off in our private life off in our relationships, off in our relationship with God. And I'll just say it, this is one of those series is that every single one of us, myself included, needs to hear. It's also a series that you're going to want your spouse to hear as well. No joke, if you're married, do yourself a favor and make sure your spouse is here. You, it's a series you want your roommates to know about, your friends to know about, your kids to know about. Honestly, get them here. And so we're starting up this series. In addition to that, though, to celebrate fall kick off Sunday, both at our West Side and T campuses. We're going to, we're just going to go all out. We're having inflatables for the kids. We have a DJ. We're giving out several pairs of Minnesota Vikings tickets. There's that and other fun things as well for families. Again, that's at West Side and T only. One other quick thing at our T campus starting next Sunday, we are adding a third service there as well. In T, we're going to be adding an 8 a.m. service, which we're so excited about just to open up as many seats as we can. Just in general, though, next Sunday is going to be a great Sunday, and it's another perfect week to invite a family member, neighbor, coworker, and tell them to come. Honestly, if there's someone in your life that you're like, man, God just keeps highlighting this person, go out of your way this week to invite them. Okay, so today we are wrapping up our series called That One Time, and the heart of this series is looking back at the times in our lives where we did something and we only wish we could go back and change it. A time, a that one time where we did something and we only wish we could forget about it. A time where ever since the day it took place, it's filled us with unforgiveness, embarrassment, and Regret, And so we started off this series by asking this simple question, what's that one time for you? And today I just want to ask us all again, what's that one time for you? What's a time that you only wish you could go back and change what took place? And so the first week we asked this question and then I had everyone write it down on a card as a way of acknowledging these things and confessing them to God. And today, again, I just want to read some of the things that were shared. And I I only do so because so often it is easy to believe the lie that everyone else in church is perfect. I hear it often. Everyone else's marriage is perfect. Everyone else's family is perfect. Everyone else's lives are perfect. It is so easy to believe that we are the only one who is jacked up. But friends, that is not the case, okay? To to be so clear, there's no names, there's no specifics on these, but again, I just want to read some of them just to let you know you are not the only one. One person shared that one time I was controlling. Another person said that one time I picked up the bottle and I didn't put it back down. One person wrote that one time I lied about money and I continue to lie about money. That one time I went to that house. That one time I had sex before marriage. That one time I took something that wasn't mine. That one time I was addicted to gambling. One person wrote, that one time I cut myself. That one time I lost my crap on my kids. That one time I stood by and watched someone else be bullied. 
One person wrote, that one time I sent photos of myself. Another person said, that one time I had a long time affair. Lastly, one person wrote, that one time they put in, there are too many times to write down. Again, friends, I promise you, promise you, you are not the only one. So, so far in this series, we've talked about unforgiveness and embarrassment. Today, though, I want to talk about regret. Often, in response to our that one times, one of the feelings that we feel is regret. It's like I, I, I did something in the past, and I just wish I could go back and change it. Or I, I, did, I did something, I said something, and I just wish that I could change the past. Now, in theory, this is great, but to quote the great Doc Brown, Marty, you can't just go back in time and change things without considering the ripple effects. And yes, I was just looking for a reason <laughs> to quote back to the future. And after seeing this photo, if you need a therapist, just let me know. I know a few of them. I can, I can tell you though. But seriously though, today we're talking about regret. And just to make sure we're all on the same page, regret is the gap between how things are and how they could have been different. That's so important. Regret is the gap between how things are and how they could have been different. Like maybe for you, it's like if I wouldn't have screwed up, well then I'd still be married. If, if I wouldn't have blown up my life, then my kids would still respect me. If I wouldn't have done X, well then my life would be so much better, I'd be so much happier. And I'm just saying as a result of that one time, I have so much regret and there's just this gap, right? And regret is the gap between how things are and how they could have been different. Now, before we go any further, when it comes to regret, I just want to acknowledge that every so often you'll hear someone say, well, I've got no regrets. I've got no regrets. The past is the past and I don't look back. Yeah, I've got, I've got no regrets and they might even have it tattooed on their chest, okay? <laughs> Seriously though, my response to no regrets, well, that's garbage. I got no regrets. That's garbage. To be clear, yes, we shouldn't dwell in the past. And if, we've, if, we, have, if we, we shouldn't dwell in the past, we shouldn't be consumed with the past, especially if we've, if we've dealt with the past, we shouldn't let us get, a, get, a, get us tripped up. But as followers of Jesus, we should absolutely grieve our stupidity. No regrets, no. Like if we've screwed up and hurt people, especially if we haven't addressed it, yeah, that should bother us. No regrets, no. Are that one time? It should make us pause. Friends, I'm just saying, if you haven't dealt with it or addressed it, especially if it's hurt someone else, no regrets is a super jerky way to live. It's like, son, I've got no regrets. I know I cheated on your mom and I blew up your life when you were a little kid, but I've got no regrets. Dad, can I be honest with you? You're a jerk. No regrets. You're a jerk, dad. No, like, really. Seriously, if you and I are quick to say no regrets, let me translate that for you. We're basically not taking responsibility for our lives. Again, specifically if we haven't addressed it. Okay, so regret. We can't go back and change the past, and we can't change what we've done, so what do we do with it? And also, what does God have to say about it? Well, throughout this series, we've been mentioning Paul over and over again, and Paul was one of the main pastors in the early church. He wrote a large portion of the New Testament, but I, I just want to acknowledge that before following Jesus, Paul had a really, really sketchy past. Like, to put it lightly, he had some major that one times. Just listen to this. At one point, a guy named Stephen was arrested for talking about Jesus. And well, because Stephen wouldn't stop talking about Jesus, in Acts chapter 7, this is what took place. They, the crowd rushed at Stephen and dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. His accusers took off their coats and laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul. If we don't know, before Paul became a Christian, his name was Saul. Saul is Paul before he met Jesus, and it goes on to say, 
as they stoned Stephen, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He fell to his knees shouting, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. And with that, he died. And this last verse, and Saul approved of their killing him. Friends, just to say it again, Paul became one of the main pastors in the early church. He wrote a large portion of the New Testament, yet in his past, he had some major that one times. Major. When I say major, it's not like he he partied a little bit in college and did some keg stands, and it's not like he stole ice cream from a little kid either. No, before meeting Jesus, Paul oversaw the brutal killing of people. And not just people. He created a plan to round up and murder Christians, and then he did it. That's Paul. Paul's past was so crazy that when he started following Jesus, all the other Christians didn't believe it. They thought it was a scheme. They they were scared of him, and they were literally like in fear that he was going to murder, murder them. Just listen to this. When Paul arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to meet with the believers, but they were all afraid. They did not believe that he had truly become a believer. Friends, today, here's the first thing I want to highlight. Looking at Paul, regardless of your regret, God's not done with you. Again, today, when it comes to our that one time, looking at the life of Paul, regardless of your regret, God's not done done with you. No kidding. Again, Paul was killing Christians, and yet God looked at him and said, I'm not done with this guy. That's, that's crazy. Seriously, for all of us, do you have some regrets, maybe even some big ones, and you're convinced that your life is over and that your best days are behind you, and if you could just go back and change the past, things would be so much better, friend, regardless of your regret. God's not done with you. Regardless of your regret, God still has a plan for your life. As long as you have breath in your lungs, God still wants to redeem you. He still wants to be with you. He still has a purpose for you. He still wants to overwhelm you in the best way with his joy and his love and his kindness and his goodness. Regardless of your regret, God's not not done with you. Thank God. God's not done Several years back, I was watching the news, and I randomly saw a news story about a college kid that had done a whole bunch of really, really, really stupid things. And he got arrested, and he was thrown in jail. As I was watching that morning, I felt the nudge, Adam, you should reach out to that guy. Oh, no. In response, I was like, no. God, this is a great idea, but I'm busy. And also I have no idea who this kid is. And so that'd just be really, really weird. And so again, yeah, no. Several days passed. I didn't think twice about it. And then someone randomly brought up something that was kind of sort of connected with this news story again. And I immediately heard it once more. Yeah, Adam, you should reach out to that guy. You should reach out to that guy. I have to be honest, the second time I was kind of annoyed. It's like, God, I I really don't have the time and I don't even know who this kid's name is. Like, I don't have no idea who he is or how I'd find him or how to even get get a hold of him. But it just kept hearing, you should reach out to him. You should reach out to this kid. You should reach out to this kid. Finally, it was like, all right, God. So I end up trying to search for the news story. I find this kid's name and I'm like, I don't know who that is. I drop it into Instagram, which is really bizarre and kind of weird. And I find the kid and it's like, he doesn't follow me and I don't follow him and I have no idea who he is. And so I sent him this DM. I was just like, hey, so-and-so, I'm praying for you. Please let me know if there's anything that I can never do. Push send. Less than 15 minutes later, I get a response from him, Adam, It's been a rough couple of days. Your DM meant so much to my mom and I. Is there any chance that you'd be willing to meet up with us and pray over me? 20 minutes later, completely against my will, I'm going there angry, no joke. I'm pulling up my car in front of this beautiful house, this college kid standing there with his mom, and 
He's this tall, sharp-looking guy. As I walked up, he's just like, Adam, I can't believe that you're here. I'm just so grateful. I, I can't believe that you would show up like this. I said back, well, honestly, I don't really want to be here. And genuinely, the only reason that I'm here is because God has been harassing me all week long. And he just wants me to tell you that he, that he loves you, that he sees you, and that he still has so many good things for you. And that this one time doesn't define who you are. Immediately, this kid's head fell down. And you just see how much he needed to hear that God wasn't, wasn't done with him yet. God wasn't done. When I, when I left, I might have told the kid uh, 15 years from now, when you've learned from this and you've become a successful CEO of a large company, all I'd ask is that you'd remember me and invite me to spend some time on your sweet boat, okay? Uh, that's literally what I, what I told him. Once again, regardless of your regret, God's not done with you. God's not done with you. Okay, so Paul, he went from killing Christians to being one of the main pastors in the early church. He wrote a large portion of the New Testament. He started all these different churches. But in one of the letters that Paul wrote, he wrote to a group of Jesus followers in Rome. And he was talking to them about what their life looks like before Jesus and how it changes you after you start following Jesus. And in the the middle of this letter, Paul shares some of the most powerful words that you will read anywhere in scripture. And especially today, as we think about our, our that one time, and we think about the regret that we feel, these words are so critically important for us to know. Listen to this, Paul says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Friends, don't miss this. We're told, Paul says, that God works out all things for good. Not, not some things and not a, not a couple of things and not just our good actions. No, when we start following Jesus, God begins to work out all things for good. Friends, this includes your that one time. This includes your regrets. This includes your foolish ways. This includes your stupidity. This includes all of your regrets. Seriously, I just look at Paul. And one of the main reasons that he has all this influence, one of the main reasons that his teachings are so powerful, it isn't in spite of his past. No, it's actually because of his past. Like Paul knew how great his sin was, and he knew how terrible his past was, and he clearly knew how desperately he needed Jesus, and also everyone else knew, and they had heard all about all the terrible things that he had done, and now this same guy is following Jesus? What? There's no way. It's impossible. Once again, regardless of your regret, God is not done with you, but it goes further than this. And today, here's the second thing I want to highlight. It's it's this. God wants to use your regret for good. He wants to use your regret for good. That thing that you did that you only wish you could change, God wants to use that for good. To be so clear, what happened and what you did in the past, it's not good at all, but God can and he wants to use all of it for good. I can just hear the response, Adam, that's impossible. You don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've said. You don't know how I blew up my my life. You don't know. Like there is no way that God can use all of this for good. Friends, I know it sounds impossible, but thankfully this is one of the things that is so wonderful about our God. He can use everything, and I mean everything for good. So maybe for you on your card, you wrote down that one time, I got a DUI. You're like, Pastor, tell me, help, help me out with this one. Friends, if that's you and you now have sobriety, you know what it's like to struggle with addiction. You know what it's like to hit rock bottom. You know what it's like to see your name in the news and be totally embarrassed. And as a result, God can specifically use you to help someone else in the same exact place. I found one of the most powerful, some of the most powerful words that another person can hear is I've been where you are. And you, you're going you're gonna to make it through. And I promise you, tomorrow the sun will come up. 
Or maybe for you, if you wrote down, you gave into peer pressure. If that's you and now you've grown, you know what it's like to want to fit in. You know what it's like to be an outsider and you'll do anything to be an insider. And now God can use you to be a light to others. God can use you to step in and stand beside someone else and tell them, you don't have to do this. You're not alone, I'm here. Maybe for you, you wrote down, at one time I attempted suicide. Friend, if that's you and now you're in a healthier place, you know what it's like to battle depression. You know what that cloud feels like that feels like it's never gonna lift. And because of it, you're able to help someone else battle in depression and you're able to tell them, I'm still here, I'm still alive and I love my life. And yes, I might still be battling but I found victory in this area and so can, so can you. Or maybe you wrote down that one time I had an affair. I was blown away by this response, the amount of us who wrote down affair. Speaking of this, last Sunday after one of the services, I had a lady out, out in the entryway stop me and she said, Adam, this is really random to share. I, But a few years back, my husband and I went through an affair in our marriage and it was horrible. But she said, since that time, we're now both following Jesus, which is a miracle in itself. And God has completely transformed our marriage. And Adam, what I I wanted to tell you is if there's ever any couples that we can encourage walking through the same thing, we'd be so honored to share a part of our story with them. And how even after an affair, there's still a hope for their marriage. Tuesday, I got a follow-up email from her where she included pictures of her and her husband both getting baptized at our last baptism Sunday. How wonderful is that? Just to say it again, God can and he wants to use your regret for good, for good. To be so clear, this isn't easy. I can't imagine how challenging the last couple of years have been for that couple. You see, God doesn't just magically change your regret into something good, it takes hard work. It requires effort, humility, forgiveness, and prayer at times. It takes an act of God, but again, God still wants And he's able to use your that one time, your regret for good. Okay, so I want to go back to where we started with this series. Once again, we started with this question, what's that one time for you? What is it for you? Maybe you've been here all three weeks of this series and you still haven't really answered the question to yourself. You've just kind of danced around it. What's that one time for you? But friends, here's the deal though. At some point, we need to move past this question. We need to move past the unforgiveness, the embarrassment, and regret. Some of you have been completely paralyzed by your past. Some of you just continually beat yourself up over and over again. Some of you are drinking too much because of your past. Some of you are just stuck in it and you're stuck in your past and it's hurting your relationships, it's hurting your marriage, your family. It's hurting you more than anything. It's hurting your relationship with God. Listen to this. Last week, I talked about putting a stake in the ground and not going back to the person that we used to be. Well, after the service, I had a young mom in our church. One of my favorite people at Embrace sent me a message. And she just said this, Adam, I literally put a stake in the ground. God spoke to me through you on Sunday. And I'll never be the same. How rad is that? Just a mom saying, no more. I'm done. That's the person that I used to be. For all of us, here's the deal though, instead of only thinking about all the bad that has come from here that one time, instead of only dwelling about all the terrible things that have come from it since, we need to ask God to shift our mind and our focus 
And we need to start asking a better question. What's the better question? How can God use your that one time for good? That's a better question. How can he use it for good? How can he use that terrible day, that horrible situation, that thing that you said, the thing that you did, that lie, that screw up, how can God use it for good? And maybe God already has. And is there someone specific in your life that God wants you to minister to, God wants you to surround, not in spite of your past, but because of it? Maybe this place of pain, God's like, I'm gonna give you a purpose out of it. And so today, as we close up, if you're here, and instead of only looking at your one time with unforgiveness, embarrassment, and regret, if you're here, and you wanna stop being consumed with all the bad and terrible things from your past, and today you wanna ask God to shift your focus. Today, if you wanna start asking God to use your that one time for good, Right now, I'm going to pray, and I'm just going to invite you to pray with me. And so if you would, wherever you are at Campuses Network Church, if you just want to close your eyes, and I'm just going to invite you, but in the quietness of your soul, to tell God these things, is tell him, Jesus, I've screwed up. Just tell him, Lord, I've, I've made mistakes, I've sinned. And without you, God, I feel unforgiveness, embarrassment, and regret for what I've done. If you've never done so before, just ask him, Jesus, would you please forgive me? Please forgive me. Please turn my life. Lord, today I want to move forward. I want to be used by you. God, would you help me to see how you can use your, my that one time for good? Help me to see specific people that I can reach out and encourage. Lord, I'm so thankful for who you are. I'm so thankful you don't waste anything, including our mistakes, our regrets, our screw-ups. You don't waste anything. Instead, if we put our lives in, in your hands, if we put our past in your hands, God, you're able to use it for wonderful, beautiful, good things. And so we ask that you would do that. This place of shame, this place of embarrassment, regret, unforgiveness, Lord, would you transform it into a place of good? And that's something only you can do, God. And so we ask that you would do so. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. All God's people said, amen. Hey everyone, it's Adam from Embrace. If you enjoyed today's message, make sure to subscribe to Embrace's YouTube channel to stay updated. You can also click here to check out other videos. Thanks for watching.